The idea of growth has to begin somewhere. Where's one of the best places to start? By seeking both the most constructive and understanding the most destructive aspects of our nature. To do that, it takes a quiet place. It takes some time. It's not going to be done quickly. It might take three months, six months, even a year. But as long as you understand what goes into the formula of change, then you have a chance to know that you have a goal that you're going to reach. And nothing, absolutely nothing, is going to stop you from achieving that goal. All that I'm here to do is act as a facilitator of ideas, to try to stimulate you into thinking about why am I not as happy as I know I should be? Why am I not doing the things I want to do, dreamed of doing? Why am I not with the people who would support me, love me, and be as kind and gentle and, and fun with me as I thought was possible when I was a child and believed in everything? And that's what we're going to talk about, reclaiming the dreams of our youth and reenacting them as adults and seeing that absolutely everything is possible. And for every negative that you suggest to me during the next five weeks, I will show you that there is a positive solution to that negative. And that's where we're going to begin our odyssey in this version this year of our, what I call the Mastering Life series. I do once a year. The first workshop deals with specifically negativity. Why? Because I was recently watching a Tony Robbins workout, emotional workout. And there are a lot of things that he suggests that are very positive, very affirmative, very good. The trouble is I had someone three days later who was at that workshop out on Long Island called Hooked on Health or something like that who came up to me and said, uh, I was in a Whole Foods supermarket, and said, Gary, I'm confused about something. I said, what's that? He said, well, I spent this money, went to this workshop, and we were dancing and, and uh, hugging each other, and everything was so positive. I was so excited that night, I couldn't even go to sleep. I felt so empowered. And then each day thereafter, until today, I started to lose that feeling. And I wanted it back. I wanted another chance to be in that moment, that couple hours when, when I felt vital. And now I just am back to feeling negative, depressed, and kind of cynical and bitter, and thinking, well, what was that all about? Well, that is unfortunately what a lot of this human potential movement is about. And what I'm interested in is getting people to rediscover the beginning of the human potential movement of the 1960s, the end of the 1960s, that was completely forgotten or overlooked by most Americans, and rekindling it into the 1990s. Now, what do I mean by human potential movement? I mean you as one individual deciding what is the potential that I as a human being have at this time in my life, with what I know, what I've experienced, what I've felt, what I've emoted, to do something really good for me. And that's hard to do because we were led to believe that anything you do for yourself is narcissistic. Well, it isn't. Greed is not good. Egotism is not good. Self-righteousness is certainly counterproductive. But self-value, self-love is very positive. And to do that with any, without any guilt is a part of rebalancing. Health is balance. Anything that displaces balance must be addressed. The trouble is, if you go to a seminar, including this one, and all I did was talk to you about the good things that you could do for yourself and uh, for your mind and your body and your spirit, the likelihood is nothing, nothing would matter once you hit your first negative or limiting point. And you all know what I'm talking about because think of how many times in any relationship everything that was said and promised, all the expectations of what would be shared went out the window the first time the person yelled at you screamed at you, or denied you the virtue of just being happy and healthy. And that kept coming back into your mind, well, can I trust this person ever again? When will be the next time that I'll be yelled at, or denounced, or used, or lied to, or manipulated? You know the feeling when you caught someone lying to you that you've trusted? And how now you never feel the same, because there's always that inner feeling 
Am I going to be lied to again? If the person says no, but does that mean no, you're not going to be smart enough to catch me, then now that you have caught me, I'm going to be a little more clever, or no, I've changed and, and you can trust me. But we still live with some of that doubt. Well, doubt interferes with health because it displaces what is the opposite, the antithesis of doubt, and that is complete optimism, trust in whatever we're thinking or doing. And so that limits us, and that's the anchor that holds us back. So rather than starting with all the positives, like telling you everything you should eat, if I were doing a lecture on nutrition, which I used to do, I'd give a whole day workshop on everything you should eat, how you should combine it, and the next week I'd see someone sitting in a McDonald's just stuffing their face. And I thought, well, hold on, that person was in my lecture and asked me 300 questions. What are they doing there? That's the person who said, Gary, one more question. It's, it's about, should I, can you combine alfalfa and sunflower seeds if you're having radishes in a salad? And I thought they were legitimate. Now I see them eating a Big Mac, french fries, not even with their fork, just with their hands, not even with their hands. They actually go over and bury their face just in the, the food. And they give an extra $5 and they allow you to do that. You just bury, and they have up their nose as french fries, and they're asking about food combining radishes and sunflowers. I bought it, right? I, th I thought they were legitimate. Or the person who keeps coming who's overweight and says, I really want to lose weight. Give me the, and every month, every year, you see, they haven't done anything. Well, there's a game going on here somewhere, right? And the game is, Keep giving me, giving me, give me the positive. I want to hear the positive. But what you don't know is that there's this giant black hole it goes into and disappears. And that's most of the people's problems. So I reversed it. I start off with all the negatives. Because by dealing with the negatives or what doesn't work in your life, you're going to at least have the strength to know what excuses not to fall back on. Otherwise, you're going to be living with the excuses. The excuses are what prepare us for the response of other people when we don't own up to our word, when we don't repay the money, when we don't repay the affection, when we don't give unconditionally if we promised we would. Now the people are confused or disappointed about us. But we already got it in our mind what we're going to say when that happens, what we're going to say when someone sees us and the pants size hasn't come down, when the attitude hasn't changed, right? when we're still in the wrong relationship in the wrong place, and we keep making an excuse for that. But we know that the excuses work because it's a pattern of behavior. So I'm interested in breaking those negative patterns of behavior, stopping the nonsense so you can go on with your life. If you don't deal with that, all the good, all the Tony Robbins lectures, all the uh, hey lectures on affirmation, all these are meaningless. They only become meaningful if you deal with the limiting factor. But in our society, we don't like any bad news. Unfortunately, we're surrounded in bad news because we don't like to deal with the underlying cause of what doesn't work. So we like to say politically, like in a recent election, we're going to make change. Nobody gets in to make change. You ever notice that? They all say they're going to. They get in, then they don't. And we never hold them to their word. I believe that there's a point where we start having to hold ourselves to our word. If we say we're going to do something, then honor it. Don't worry about what anyone else thinks. That's the first rule of life. Do not care what anyone else thinks of you is what you care and think of yourself. Now, what are some of the ways that we can get into contact with what doesn't work? Because there are many things that don't work. I mean, we're talking about probably thousands of things that don't work. And turn these around so that when we do have positive, we will access it and we will go forward. I was watching, uh, who was it? Uh, I remember going to, oh, it was uh, River Phoenix two years ago at the um, Hard Rock Cafe, there was a benefit, animal rights benefit. And I just found it very uh, paradoxical that here are all these Hollywood stars at a bar smoking and drinking and talking about animal rights. What about their bodies? nutritional rights, their mental rights, or spiritual rights. Now we find out that he may have died from cocaine and Valium. Uh, he didn't die because he was taking too much vitamin C, that I can assure you. But Hollywood's an unusual place.
know, in the daytime, everybody likes to be, you know, a vegetarian. Nighttime, everyone's on coke, heroin, you know, and doing some crazy things. It's a strange world we live in where people think that as long as they do something over here that's right, they can go ahead and do something else that's wrong, as if they counterbalance. Well, let me explain. Negatives and positives do not counterbalance one another. Every negative undoes a positive. You never, never lose a relationship because two people have such unconditional love for one another and respect each other and enjoy each other. You lose a relationship because someone is hurting the other person or not meeting some needs. So it doesn't take a lot to screw up a situation. The trouble is we almost always know what it is that's screwing up situations. We just don't know what to do about it or how to stop it. All right? You know why you overeat. You know? And you know every time you go to put food in your mouth, you don't you like the food, but you don't like what it's going to do to you. You don't like how you're going to feel after you do it. And that starts a compound cycle. But what's missing? What's in that equation that's not working? Somehow your life is going two and two is six, two and two is eight, two and two is ten. It's never adding up. Right? It's just something's not there, and you don't know what's not there. This just doesn't make any sense. Nor does anything else make sense. It's a crazy world, isn't it? We're told to balance a budget, and yet we ask people to spend themselves into bankruptcy to keep an economy going that's based upon you going into debt in order to keep an economy going. You're told to buy things you don't need and then to throw them away and to pollute our environment, though we want to protect our environment, but we need you to pollute it so someone else can make a lot of money cleaning it up. We need you to be sick so you can supply your sick bodies to a medical, pharmaceutical, high technology industry and the hospital so they can make a profit. $65 million went to the president of one hospital corporation last year, a salary. It's a very profitable business, the most profitable business in the world, more profitable than cocaine or drugs. $1 trillion went for the profit for you to be sick. Well, there's no profit compared to that for being well. We talk about wanting to give people the best news, and we give them only the worst news. We show them rapes and murders and kids burning to death and fires, and as if somehow that knowledge of that event in some locale is going to change my life or affect it. It doesn't. It only causes a reaction, and reactions negate reason. We don't have fundamental changes in our consciousness or change the nature of problems because we are inundated in negativity, and yet you don't see positive news. Positive news doesn't sell. People think, well, that's boring. So we surround ourselves with everything that we consider not to be boring, and it is almost all destructive. It is negative. Oprah, Phil, all these people, they give us the worst of human nature, and then they tell us, gee whiz, you know, make us rich, make us famous for giving you the visceral of human psychic conditions. And we do. We say, oh, we give us something even more bizarre, stranger than strange. self-righteously proclaims he was offended, which he may have been, uh, from uh, the Friars Club. But the whole idea of going to a Friars Club is to be offended. Maybe he didn't go to college. Maybe, maybe did anyone ever look into his notes to see if there's a brain? You know, the Friars Club roasts are roast. You know what a roast is? Offensive, degrading, sexist, racist humor. You ever made a racist comment? Give me a break. Of course he has, and everyone else in the world has thought or heard something and you've laughed at inappropriate comments. Everyone has heard something. Could you imagine the worst joke you've ever heard and laughed at if someone knew or saw you and suddenly there was a picture on the news of you hearing this joke and laughing? And suddenly you're judged by that? Could you imagine the worst that you've ever said to someone in your family or friend over the telephone or in person? And that's what you're judged for. And suddenly, that's what we know you as. Now, think of the conversations you've had with people in your life, right? Think of the people you've screamed at, yelled at, where you couldn't even scream any louder because there was no higher octave you could go. Ah, you had it out here, and then how hard you slammed down the phone. And what if we captured that on film, where you're, ah, and, and that's Barbara. Barbara said, waka daka waka do. And that's what we know. You see. But if someone else does that, and he said this, oh my God, he 
did? Well, how terrible. I would never say anything like that. <laughs> Isn't it amazing how self-righteous society is? I love it. You know? Everybody acting like they've never said an inappropriate word, never laughed at anything that was stupid. Have you ever laughed at Jerry Lewis, Bob Hope? There's two inappropriates, right? <laughs> so I could understand. I, I could really understand if there was a history of something that would make that humor different. But then I turned right on the television yesterday, and I see people who have taken away the uh, stepdaughters, stepfathers who are having are marrying their stepdaughters or some strange combination. And I'm thinking, oh yeah, well, gee whiz, I, I can certainly understand why you were offended by, you know, someone in blackface and uh, would, you know, march out and raise hell, but you're not offended by your own show. You're not offended by your own guests. You're not offended by the fact that you are up there selling the most base, stupid, vulgar, disgusting, pornographic aspects of human nature to make a buck. And don't tell me you're doing it for free, Montel. I don't believe anything you have to say. And I don't like you. I really don't. But at least I'm honest. Because I don't like hypocrisy. I don't like Donahue. I don't like any of these people. Right? Isn't it amazing? It's like Jimmy Swagger. Let's see where the next Jimmy Swagger pops up in these, these people, right? Is that somehow their house is holier than someone else's house. It's amazing what self-righteousness does to you. It can really bend you in half. It's different when you're a child and you step back and you just see things as they are. Because you haven't learned yet to identify rights and wrongs to it. You just see it for what it is. And then you start seeing the contradictions and everything. Right? The doctor's sitting there telling you don't need vitamins and they're fat and they're smoking and they're drinking coffee. Uh, you don't need vitamin C. <sighs> look at me. <sighs> yeah, look at you. Look, look at your heart. Do you know where your heart is? Somewhere under this fat. All right? Can you feel your arteries? Can't. They're just like stone in there, clogged. But I've got a coronary bypass I can take. $65,000, and it's on sale. Not including flowers. And I've got, I've got to listen to this person, and he's telling me I don't need vitamins. All right? And then I got to listen to the CIA tell me that Aristide shouldn't go back because he's crazy. And we all go, whoa, he's crazy. We don't want a crazy person running a country. And we had Ronald Reagan? <laughs> Where's his profile, the jelly bean president? And we don't, we don't want anyone unstable. You think I'm a wimp? You think I'm a wimp? American public thinks I'm a wimp. What country gets yeah? What country can we invade? Panama. We'll tell them that if they beat up on a GI. We'll go in there, break all international rules. We'll kill 5,500 Panamanians. Lie, say we only killed 300, and they deserved it. And uh, we'll only show the bombed out bad you know neighborhoods. We'll have all nice upper middle class Panamanians on television saying, "Yay, yay, America!" We'll show all 55 of them in a country of six million, and we'll avoid all the rest and make sure we get Tom Brokaw down there because he's always on our side. And we'll, we'll get what, what's his name that always is so stiff, walks right. Uh, what's that banker's name? Really stiff, tight. You know, uh, Dan Rather. Yes. I mean, have you ever seen someone who is so indeterminated and he needs to have a real dump? Lighten up, Tom. Trilateral Commission is going to be here next year as well as this year. Hadn't gone anywhere. And I don't see that story being covered. But think of that. Think what happens when a person's ego gets affected and suddenly a national policy is based upon someone not being perceived as weak. And so we just decide which country we want to go into, right? We actually went into Granada. Do you all remember that? No one even knew where Granada was, right? Half the armed forces flew over the damn island. 27 Cubans, right, running around. And we invade an entire island over the stupidest things. But it served some political purpose for someone to project an image. And we think all this is normal. We think it's normal when you go in and you're told that you can't repay a debt because you're only in a middle-income bracket and the bank, well, they don't trust you. 
And that same banker, the bank turns around and gives $800 billion in bad debt to banana republic dictators that they love. There's never been a dictator that we didn't love so much that we wouldn't give them all the billions they asked for. And now we want a North American trade agreement so that we can go back in there and create economies that will repay those $800 billion in loans. When did you hear that discussed? That's the agenda. But we don't think. And that's the one thing you can be assured of. Because healthy, happy, balanced people don't buy into any of the craziness. We don't buy into a medical system that says trust us and all it gives us more disease. A banking system that is bankrupt. Politicians that are patent liars. Sports heroes who are given $80 million contracts. That's more than all the Nobel laureates in world history combined. It shows you something about our values. We've gone a little crazy, I think. And somehow in this craziness, we've lost our own sense of self. And it's easy to understand. It's kind of hard to really figure out where you belong when every place you look where you want to belong, you see that there's a lot of craziness there that you don't want to belong to. Where, where are you going to belong to? You want to belong to the upper middle class American elite, right? Where there's manicures and pedicures and clean ears, right? And clean shaven. What do you got to give up to become a part of that? What has to go? Truth, honesty, principles. What do you have to compromise to start fitting in? I look at the mess of our society today, and I don't want to fit into any of it. There's no place I feel comfortable being out there, so I just kind of hang with myself. See? Because at least I trust me, and I know I'm not going to let myself down, and I know I'm not going to do anything stupid to other people. I'm not going to hurt people. I'm not going to lie to people. I'm not going to dishonor people. I'm not going to try to make people as crazy as I might be if I were imbalanced. I'm not going to lay things on people, but out there, hey, that's the, that's the thing of the day. When the most popular news magazines or publications in America that are sold every week and the most popular shows on television and radio all show us at our worst and because they're profiting from it. Now somewhere, someone's got to figure out, is this the best we can do? I mean, is there only a little oasis around that we'll escape in culture and education and religion and socializing, but the mass of it is like a cancer to where we try to find uh, a few healthy cells still remaining to reside? Doesn't make sense. The idea of having to run off to Boulder, Colorado, or to uh, any other town uh, where there's still sanity, that doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? I mean, it's like saying, there's Central Park, and I live near the park, but it's not my park, it's the Muggers Park, so I can't go into the Muggers Park. This is my street, and here's my car, but it's not really my car, so I have to put a sign in my car that everybody else has says, please do not break in, there's no radio, there's no spare tire. You know, uh, and we have to actually acknowledge that my car is no longer mine, it's someone else's to do with what they want. That doesn't make sense, does it? And so a few people hold an entire group of people around the park hostage, not to use their own facilities, people to go out on the streets at night. Something's wrong. Something's wrong in all races, in all classes. The number one reason that black men are killed are other black men. Something's wrong. You don't hear about that, and that's wrong. Because if a black kills a white, you hear about it. But if a black kills a black, you don't hear about it. Why not? When you see a white in jail, you always see them neat and with lawyers, and, you know, sitting in court, pleading. When you see a black, you see them being arrested. Why is that? There's something not right here. So I start off by looking at what isn't right and just pointing up, and it's a painful thing to hear and feel and see at what we've all, in some way, become or participated in. And only when we see how we are a part of that negative image can we change. Because if you don't recognize what part you are, you're going to continue to be a part of it. And that's what keeps us going down. So it's when you claim the real self and you say, hold on, I don't buy into this anymore. I'll give you an example. 
I went to the station where I work and I said, I refuse to accept that you can't come up with better programming than much of the anti-Semitism I hear on this radio station. And I'm opposed to it, I'm offended by it, and I want you to know that I will not tolerate it. Well, it got their attention. And then I thought, how about all those other people who've told me the same thing here on the air but have never gone up and confronted them? What are they afraid of, losing the job? Well, at some point, you gotta put yourself on the line. You gotta stand up for what you really believe in, even if it means losing something. I mean, the whole idea of change is that you've gotta feel uncomfortable. Change is never gonna occur unless there's discomfort. And the problem is we want to be completely certain of everything before we do change. Well, what can be certain? What certainties can I give you that your next job, your next relationship, your next insight is going to be more constructive or inducive than your last? I can't. There is no such thing. And I see it in small ways and major ways. There was a, uh, a fella in a race. And he trains hard, but when I see him in a race, I never see him racing with everything in here, the real heart of the athlete. I, I never see him let go. So as a result, he's always being passed at the end of a race. Even a 20-mile race, 24-mile race, in the last 100 yards, he'll see that someone's coming from behind, and he could do better, and he just holds his pace. And afterwards, I say, why didn't you let go? Why didn't you just give it all you had? And he says, well... You know, I was giving my best. No, you weren't. You weren't willing to go into discomfort. And it's correct. Now I acknowledge, yes, you're right. I wasn't willing to make myself uncomfortable. Well, how many times in life do we acquiesce to something we know is not right because we don't want the consequences of feeling discomfort? Having someone dislike us, judge us, challenge us, fire us, alienate us from them. So we compromise. But compromise weakens us inside because the inner voice knows what's right and doesn't like to be lied. And it's what feels. So on the outside, we show one thing and do one thing, and inside, something else is occurring. I want to see that reconciled. I want to see that whatever you're feeling inside, that's what you do outside. That whatever your conscious says, that's what your actions show. So there's not a contradiction between, yeah, I've liked it, and then you don't. Well, I know, but then I don't. I could, but then I don't. You've all done that so many times. Step up to the line and then back right off again. Not today, not today. Well, today's here. So let's see what we can do. I'm going to, I realize you can't read this, and especially for the, the people watching this now. I'll go through each of these as points of discussion. And this is interactive. So please don't feel that you have to sit here and just listen. If you have something that un you're uncertain about, uh, ask. All right, just hold up your hand, I'll address you and ask, and I'll repeat it so everyone can hear it. How much and in what ways did those closest to you care about you? Let's start there, because that starts making assets. We're gonna have a diary, and each week I want you to keep the diary. And I want you to bring your diary each week because we're going to be doing things from your diaries. Now, the diary should be on two pages at all times or even two diaries. One should be the positive, one should be the negative. And we're going to fill both of them up. If you know who in your family or who in your life who's close to you really supports you unconditionally, is on your side, then list those people and what they mean to you. What role do they play in your life? How do they impact upon you? How do they affect you? Now, how do these people care about you? What do they do? Now, here's what we're going to understand from this. Some people you will find along the way that you thought were there to care for you are more interested in being cared for by you. And therefore, what you thought was what they were doing in your interest is actually a hidden agenda for their interest. And what's important is not that people will not need us, people need each other. But just to be honest about what your real needs are, what you're willing to share, what you're willing to accept, where your boundaries are, so that you can be very clear, so at least you have a chance of saying, here are my needs, 
what are yours and see which ones match. What you can find enjoyable in the other person, the whole idea of being with other people is that you're sharing strengths, not weaknesses. Society plays on our weaknesses. When you see a show where someone has been abused, everybody starts to cry because they're associating sympathetic reactions or memories. They're playing upon this synergistic negativism. Well, what about sharing the best that you are, the strengths of your nature? This is what the purpose of a relationship is. Relate to the best you can be to another person. Have them there to support you unconditionally, or at least know what the conditions are. If you don't, you're going to pay for it. All right, for the one thing you have that might be good, you might be getting two other things that are not good. That's not a good exchange. In this world, we should have a relationship where it's good, good, period. No more should you accept, I mean no more should you accept the idea that because you're getting something that you think is good, you should automatically accept this other that's negative. And you hear this all the time. Are you really happy? Well, we're not happy, we're secure. What do you mean? What's that mean? Are you with someone and sharing the most important asset you have, your time and presence, with someone that you really want to be with? No, but we're secure. We have our house or our apartment, and, and it's, it's, it, we're secure. Well, prisoner is secure. I mean, I mean, I'm asking you, shouldn't you look for happiness? That's too much to look for. And that's wrong. You should look for the best of everything and make no compromise. You see, the trouble is you've been living at a 2, 3 on the scale of 10. And you've accepted that as being normal. Well, why not live at a 10? Why not live in the best of all possible manner? Now, you'll say, well, I can't do that because I don't have either the education or the knowledge or the resources or the background or the culture or the gender or the looks or something else. Wrong again. You absolutely do. You've got to make what you have work. I'll give you an example. This is a rather close example to me. I'm helping someone who's gone through a recovery movement who's a friend of mine. And then I started seeing that this guy was addicted to his own recovery movement. A lot of people hide out in recovery movements. It's a great place that you never have to do anything the rest of your life because you acknowledge your weakness and therefore you're weak. I'm an alcoholic for life, someone says. Well, wrong. That's, that's bunk. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. But somehow that, that concept caught on. So you see people at these meetings. I'm an alcohol, I'm a gambler, I'm a spender and forever, so therefore I'm, I'm constantly in this addictive state wrong. That's what you did, so you don't have to do it ever again. You can understand it. So when it came time to give this guy a chance, another lease on life and a job, all right, that was relatively easy, make some contacts. Trouble was that this guy wasn't working. Because instead, he was using his excuse mechanisms to really keep from being motivated. And I had a talk with him. I said, why don't you do this? He said, well, because I don't have this. I says, every time you're asked to do something, you show a reason why you can't do it because there's something that's not there. Well, why don't you become more resourceful? Do go out and find the answers to your problems. Well, because you see in the, in the movement he was in, if he wanted to get out of the movement, that's what he would have done. He stayed in the movement, so therefore he looked for excuses. And in our society, we accept excuses. Think what would happen if you stop accepting excuses. Things change. When people are late, I don't get angry, and I don't even ask them why they were late. I just say, now you're here. Right? And that's all that matters. It matters that then they're there. I don't say, my God, you're five minutes late. I mean, I'm, my time's not valuable. Do you realize I'm sitting here, I had a nice dinner, now my dinner, it's, it's all up in its gobbledygook. I actually had my, my face was relaxed today. I went to a TM session and we sat there with the yoga baha hadoo and we were going, um, yum, 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 yum. and now look at me, look at my face. My face is wrinkled, I'm a prune. I wasn't, this, you made me upset. You got, you were late. 